What's up, and welcome back to Nostalgia Pod, your weekly look at what's going on in pop culture. Dave, end of year. I can't believe this is our second end of year pod. One more to go, and that is 2018. Oh, yeah. Yes, sir, dog. Grind so away. I am with Dave Martinson, my uh, my co-host and uh, trusty music source. We're going to be doing the year in review for the top albums, top songs, and just looking at some of the trends of the year. Before we jump into it, though, give us a subscription down below. Share us with us. Give us a rating review on iTunes. Go to soundcloud.com slash nostalgiapod and let your friends know they can listen to us any way they want. SoundCloud, Stitcher, Apple, wherever. However. Um, wherever you get your so pod. Yeah, we, we, have a, we have a lot to get to today. Let's uh let's start with some of the trends of the year. So we're gonna we're gonna do trends, albums, songs in that order. Maybe the trend that was most intriguing about this year, uh, something that has seemed to be uh, falling off in the last couple of years and then made a triumphant return. The Billboard Top 100, Dave. So why did why did the Billboard 100 make such a big comeback this year? Yeah, the Hot 100. Hot 100. Um, yeah, well, the Billboard chart had and there's a lot of billboard charts the billboard 200 is the album chart hot 100 for songs those are the two ones that matter the most and they got a lot more attention recently because billboard finally updated the way they track a song it used to be solely a radio play chart and then it added uh you know like itunes purchases but now it it covers streams whether that's spotify or even youtube and that includes the free uh streaming so and then they started tracking SoundCloud streams. So as the music consumption uh, apparatus evolved, the chart finally caught up. And lo and behold, the songs that chart the highest are different than the songs they used to chart really high because in the type of genre that is most popular has changed. As Nielsen officially confirmed what we already knew, uh, rap is more popular than rock now. Way more popular. And and that's reflected on the chart all the time. I mean, fucking, we kind of saw this coming last year with Black Beatles. Mm-hmm. Was it, for Race Tremor, it was a number one hit. Then quickly, uh, Bad and Bougie at the start of the year hit number one. Mm-hmm. And then uh, Bodak Yellow, of course. Those, like, uh, but then even songs that... Uh, uh, Post Malone's uh, Rock Star with 21 yep. hit number one. And then even songs that didn't quite get there, like Exo Tour Life or fucking Little Pump's Gucci Gang. Like mm-hmm. Rap songs just take off and they can really stick around because, uh, you know, if the fans are, are just fucking smashing that stream button, it's going to stay up there. And it's it's pretty fascinating that the chart actually matters. Like People are actually talking about it more, just... Um, you know, seeing what happens on it. So it's a interesting thing to change. They did say that they're going to uh, start weighing paid streaming more than free streaming in the future. Hmm. So we'll see how that ends out. Um, but that probably would skew towards older people because, you know, older people are more likely to actually pay for streaming. So uh, that will be interesting. We'll see how that actually impacts anything. But uh, yeah, it's interesting to see the chart um, finally matter again. Yeah, and I think, you know, talking about how the streaming plays into this, uh, a playlist like Rap Caviar on Spotify, which highlights the the best and the hottest songs in the country and has, what, like a million subscribers at this point? Um, yeah, right. It's the most influential uh, playlist. streaming playlist ever, you know, <laughs> yeah. for the first of its kind. And it's it's curated, you know, it doesn't it doesn't always just pick the hot stuff it picks what's gonna be the hot stuff you know right. that's what's so cool about it this is not like radio radio is the last uh people yeah. to catch up to songs when they're hot right uh, mm-hmm. but rap caviar is at the forefront like what's number one a rap caviar right now time recording it's asap ferg's plain jane remix with Nicki minaj which is fucking awesome that song came out like three days ago right um but it, it's it's a song of the moment right now so it's gonna be up there and because so many eyeballs are on rap caviar, if your song is deemed interesting enough, good enough, hot enough, whatever it is to crack that uh, playlist, and of course you need to be a you know somewhat well-known artist, at least on the internet, to even have that chance, but that playlist can really catapult your streams and get you onto the chart, and that formula has you know f- uh, helped basically every rap song that was successful, besides people from you know songs from major stars. So I mean, really interesting to see. Uh, the influence of something that's so so simple and so overlooked by people that aren't paying attention. Yeah, streaming services are, are you know, 
obviously in the TV and the movie realm, they have a, a huge influence. But in for music, uh, it's been interesting to see the the impact that they've had, like artists choosing to be on some streaming platforms and not on others, or choosing to release their music on, on more popular platforms afterwards. Um, it's it's really interesting, especially moving forward, to see how streaming services are going to have the impact on culture and the amount of uh, plays that certain songs get the amount of popularity as some artists get. Mm -hmm. um, speaking of uh, like popularity, I've seen a lot of articles talking about the death of poptimism. I don't know yeah. if I if I believe it, but Katy Perry dropped a dud this year, and so did Taylor right. Swift. Two that were two people that are at the center of poptimism and just dropping quality, you know, pop hits that deserve to be talked about and dissected. Made two pretty shitty albums this year, and spoiler alert: Reputation is not going to be on either one of our. Oh fucking no! Lists. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so the death of optimism, I don't think is as black and white as some people like to talk about it. Um, if you're looking to read about it, look for stuff by John Carmonica from the New York Times. He's an excellent music writer, and he's talked about it a lot over the years. He's been in the game a long time. Um, but so I, I mean, death of optimism, I don't know if we can totally de declaratively say that because just last year, 2016, uh, Poptimism was in full force. Mm -hmm. Chance the Rapper, Beyonce, Solange, and Frank Ocean. Those four albums were universally lauded, and it was like consensus they had the best albums, so we'll cheer louder because of it. Basic Poptimism. But that was okay, because those were the best records. You know, it wasn't, right. We weren't building up anything that uh, you know, didn't deserve it just because the person was really famous or had you know, a label of support or anything. Um, this year, all the artists that could have fit that mold released bad albums or mediocre efforts you know you just mentioned katy perry and taylor swift of course they're the most uh, uh obvious examples but also someone like miley cyrus even um yeah. even the kesha kesha record didn't set the world on fire as an album um and i think you know we talk about poptimism I, the, the new rules are changing in terms of what it, being a pop star i think you know uh, we mentioned rap caviar uh, the rise of soundcloud rap uh, the internet in general the streaming age uh it's easier than ever to be a pop star the definition of a pop star is broad pop as a genre yeah. is more of a format than an actual genre of music you know the top 40 chart the billboard chart mm -hmm. is more the genre than you know the actual pop music um but because of this situation it's hard to stand out, you know, in terms of like being truly ubiquitous the way someone like Katy Perry. Like Katy Perry's whole artistry was just being ubiquitous because she didn't drop fucking smash after smash. Right. And this year when she didn't drop any smashes because her album was bad and so were the songs, what is Katy Perry, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's actually interesting because when I was uh, writing that down as one of the trends to talk about, I was looking at the top of my my best of the year album list and the two there at the top not to spoil anything i think could arguably be considered pop albums as well i mean uh, i don't think it's gonna be surprised that kendrick is gonna be on my list that he is a pop star at this point i mean as much as he is a, a rap god he's a, a big enough artist at this point where he fits the the poptimism right role. same with lord who's also gonna be on my list yeah so and that's the thing pop yeah. stars um the biggest pop stars don't make traditional pop music again the rise of rap right. is a big part of that um you know like the the rock star definition is being fulfilled by people that aren't actually making rock music it's the same thing but then you know going back to the new rules i mean the new the new age you know pop stars coming like a halsey or a logic or a selena gomez or a sean mendez camila cabello whoever there's a lot of them post malone even like mm -hmm they all kind of have their own subsects of pop music, right? With their hardcore fans and all their support. But will anyone really get to the, you know, the old uh, way of being just so, so massive as a true pop artist anymore? I don't know. It's, it's an interesting discussion and it's still uh, ongoing as the music continues to change, but um, it's, it's fascinating. And <laughs> I don't know if we can totally say Poptimism is dead because there is a few year end lists by, uh, well-known publications that have Taylor Swift's reputation like top 10 
which is just <laughs> insane. I think that if they're doing that, it's just for clicks at this point. There's no way that Taylor Swift's album should be a top 10 album this year. I, I think I listed like 10 more honorable mention albums, and Taylor Swift was not even thought about. Um, uh, you know, the last thing I want to talk about just in terms of trends uh, as we wrap up uh, was just kind of the rise of, I don't even know if it's rise, but the breakout of two major producers this year. We talked about it quite a bit on the pod, so we don't need to belabor it, but Jack Antonoff and uh, Greg Kirsten just dropped. I mean, they're, they're just working with the biggest stars. Their albums tend to rise to the top. Jack Antonoff worked with Lord, um, Taylor Swift this year, St. Vincent, Greg Kirsten with Halsey, Foo Fighters, Adele. He won Adele last year. He won the Grammys this year. Uh, Sia and Beck, who all dropped albums this year. So the, these guys are just, uh, if you see a pop album, most likely one of those two are working on it in some respect. Uh, so just keep those names in mind as you move move forward and as you think about pop culture and who's helping to shape it. Um, especially, I think, Ansonoff, because Kirsten seems to be, a, I mean, he pushes the, the boundaries. The Foo Fighters talked about the influence he had in, in pushing them. But Antonoff literally takes a very um, idiosyncratic way of approaching yeah. music. I mean, Green Light, what, probably one of the biggest songs off melodrama, the biggest song off melodrama, not even a question, uh, is called Incorrect Writing by Max Martin. Yep. Uh, yeah, I was, I was that, that's gonna, totally. Go ahead. I was just going to bring up Max Martin because Jack Antonoff actually produces in a way that's uh, kind of the opposite of Max Martin and like Dr. Luke, the old way of producing. Right. I mean, traditional pop producers, uh, the sound you can you can look across all the, uh, the the whole landscape the past year year or two. The production is very similar. It's very safe. Yep. Um, but someone like Antonov actually is taking a risk and actually making his own <laughs> his yep. own influence on it. You can find his 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 you know influence everywhere, as you just said. So uh, yeah, shout out those two guys actually uh, trying to curate, do something different. Um, yeah. So if if any other trends you want to touch on before we move on, all right. Top albums, Gene. Let's uh let's do our honorable mentions first. I mean, I wrote down a ton of these, dude. Uh, the first one I wrote down for an honorable mention, Good For You by Amina. I feel like that's an yeah. album that one of mine we too. talked about and didn't get enough love. Um, but that is just a fun-ass album, dude. Yeah. One of the years I stood out as an honorable mention. Uh, Rhapsody's La La's Wisdom. It's actually nominated for Best Rap Album. I think it's a really uh, great listen. It's very lyrical. It uh, has a lot to say, and uh, Rhapsody continues to grow as an MC. It's a it's a great record. Awesome. Uh, I put down Paramore's After Laughter, which I've I've been going back and forth to decide not to put it on my list. I know that was yep. something one that you really appreciated as well. Um, and yeah, also, definitely out uh, definitely out of left field in terms of their past uh, work. You know, the '80s influence. It was a pleasant surprise earlier this year. Yeah, also just a couple to just run through quick. St. Vincent, Mass Seduction, we talked about that one. Um, Thundercat, Drunk. Uh, Mount Kimby, Love Us Survives, we talked about. Beck Colors. And uh, two that I didn't talk about that I just wanted to shout out. Julian Baker, Turn Out the Lights, and Always Antisocial Lights. Those two albums are great. We didn't get to talk about them on the pod, but if, you, uh, if you're looking for something just to finish up your year you haven't gotten to, I recommend those two albums. What other honorable mentions do you want to jump into? Yeah, I just have two more. Uh, Without Warning, the uh, solo uh, project, album, whatever, by uh, Metro Boomin, 21 Savage, and Offset from Egos uh, had no business being as good as it was. Just a uh, bunch of fucking bangers. <laughs> and <laughs> and it, it's funny because they don't they have very different styles. You know, Offset's very uh, all about the glamour, where 21's all about the... Uh, the murder and uh, it works really well uh, a lot of good songs on there mm -hmm. and then my other uh, honorable mention is more life by drake uh, it was a ah. uh, great great uh follow-up to views definitely uh more uh, lively uh, a lot of good songs in there i really like uh galchester i think and no long talk probably are the ones that have stuck with me the most portland uh, but yeah portland's amazing too i know you might have a record on there coming up uh, so is it too long? Yes, of course, but it's a playlist, so it's okay. 
We can't even make our album of the year. Uh, Drizzy Drake, as he gets <laughs> to his uh, 30s, he's doing just good, just fine. So, Dave, what, what was your number 10 album for the year? My number 10, I didn't initially have this because I, I, despite acknowledging this problem in the past, I still forgot. Uh, Run the Jewel 3. <laughs> oh, it did make your list. Check you out. Yeah, I had Run I the mean, Jewel to number 5 for me. Right. I mean, it's, uh, it was a better record than uh, More Life, so I decided to put it in there anyway. Mm-hmm. Um, came out on, what, Christmas Eve 2016? Yeah. Dropped at like so, 10 I mean, o'clock I, on Christmas Eve. Yeah, so obviously I missed everyone's list, both publications and ours, and I, I'm, I think it's being forgotten by a lot of the outlets, too, as oh, far as what I've read. Um, but it's the best Run the Jewels record to date. Uh, Run the Jewels, of yeah. course, kind of like an LP, very poignant, very lyrical guys. LP's got a very unique production. Uh, they're OGs in the game, so they uh, they really know their way on the mic. And, I mean, Call Tickerton uh, video just came out. Legend has it was in the Black Panther teaser. Um, it's, I mean, it's just yeah, excellent rap. And anyone who says that rap is uh, really bad these days, usually those people haven't heard of Run the Jewels, you know? Um, yeah, there's, no, there's nothing bad to say about the record or those guys yeah i think the only thing i wanted to add was this is like their most um bombastic and and biggest album too and it's kind of almost like a proclamation of like run the jewels as like an institution in the rap game because their their rhymes are fantastic even the song that they dropped for the fifa game was phenomenal Mm -hmm. so uh, yeah they had a great year and they're teasing something bigger too so or something else for the end of this year so i'm gonna screw up all of our list again yeah, well, they they threw out the date, the fifteenth, and then the Call of Tickerton video came out. So I'm not sure if that's uh, all it was. Um, but they even had that uh that song on the Baby Driver soundtrack with Danger Mouse, and that actually got a Grammy uh, attention. So, uh, despite the fact that RTJ three was still snubbed, uh, they're more famous than ever, which is great. Huge year for them. Uh, my number ten was the XX ICU, uh, the return of the XX after three years. It was a. It made number ten because I thought it was a really good album that could have been better. Um, but the thing that they did best was they basically were like, "Oh, Jamie XX uh, dropped maybe the best uh, electronic record of the past ten years. We're just gonna let him take the lead, and we're gonna give our amazing vocals." And the the album is very different from other XX albums, but it's more colorful. It takes on a bigger sound palette, which is definitely important. And uh, it's worth a listen, and I think it's probably the second best album in their three album discography. But they're all pretty excellent. So uh, number two, maybe not, but definitely check it out. Uh, number nine, just to jump into my number nine, someone that I don't know if we talked about in here, Moses Sumney, a romanticism. Uh, he's an R and B singer. Uh, this was a very like quiet but like beautiful album that used layering of voice and sound and different string instruments to really get across an amazing feeling when i was th- when i listened to it i see that scene from la la land of ryan gosling and emma stone dancing with the sunset in the background a lot this seems to be like the best description i can give of it so it's really beautiful uh check that album out uh, what was your number nine dave yeah my number nine was a uh, pop record i actually found a little later after it come out it's a dua lipa's uh debut album self-titled um, mm. she's a british pop star and She's kind of been bubbling for a while and she still hasn't quite broken out in the States. I mean, the song New Rules is her biggest song. It's got like half a billion uh, YouTube plays, right? But um, overall, it's actually just a really fun album. There's a lot of like good songs on it and like lively pop music too. Like um, New Rules, Genesis, I Don't Give a Fuck, Hotter Than Hell and Blow Your Mind. I mean, five songs right there that I just really enjoy. Right. Uh, and she's, you know, she's a, a fun, a fun pop star. Uh, you know, she's got her own, uh, own little lane. Mm-hmm. So I'm happy to yeah, hear more in the future. Also, yeah, I've seen her on a lot of end of year lists. So I'm not surprised that you had her up there. What was your number eight? My number eight was Flower Boy by Tyler the Ooh. Creator. Yeah, I, you know, NPR gave this, I think, like number four or five this year, or something like that. It was really high up on their list. Yeah, I mean. Um, I don't think we expect the tower to be able to make such a cohesive, thoughtful project. It was very, uh, very different from certainly different from Cherry Bomb, but even more different from uh, his, you know, early work where he was more known for being very vulgar and, uh, you know, uh, violent. Um, 
But yeah, I mean, who that boy uh, is a nice banger with Rocky, but Garden Shed, I mean, uh, uh, fucking boredom. There's so many like thoughtful, somber songs. And obviously he comes out uh, on the record, which came out of left field on its own. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, it's just, it's really, um, really well crafted. And Tyler's obviously, he's always had a great ear for production and that shines through here as well. You know, Frank Ocean comes in for a little help as well. It's uh, it's just it's a really uh, really special record. I don't I don't have any Flower Boy songs on my top ten, but I think overall as a project, it's uh, worth uh, honoring. Yeah, and sonically for Tyler the Creator, it's so different, but he incorporates different elements of like jazz and uh, yeah. R and B into it so well that it's really just well done. Um, my number eight, I'm, I think you have it on your list too. Vince Staples' Big Fish Theory. Where did it fall for you? He's number six for me number six so we're not we're not far off um yeah i i really you know listening to a lot of these albums recently to, for this list i was really just struck by like the range of the album um you know the the sound goes from like house to trap at times it, yeah. it really is just very inventive and vince also i think has some of the most uh, thoughtful and thought-provoking uh, bars on this this album um he's a, also just a really cool artist in general i really like him uh, he was he was great on Bill Simmons' show, R.I.P. Bill Simmons' show. Yeah, he's 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 hilarious. Um, it, great interview. Uh, just because. What did you like about the album? Yeah, yeah. Well, he's so frank as a person. It also comes out in his music. He'll mm-hmm. casually rap about uh, his days as a gangbanger, and then he'll immediately talk about like the prison industrial complex, like two bars later. You know, right. uh, he's he's very thoughtful, but also very frank. And like you said, the production is so varied. I mean, Cali G Funk. Obviously, he's from Long Beach, West Coast Sound. And then he'll flip to the house set. Like, listen to Bag Back. That's also in the Black Panther mm-hmm. uh, trailer, you know? Um, I've been a fan of Vince for quite some time, but this this album, no one saw it coming because he's never had so much, you know, variety in his work before. But we always knew he was a thoughtful guy. So the fact that it kind of, you know, came you know, full circle on this. It's not to say that the, uh, the record is flawless. I think there are some lulls in it because he does so many different things, but I mean, overall, just the ambition is, is uh, so commendable. Definitely. I, I totally agree with everything you said. Um, just to kind of keep it moving. Number seven for me was spoon hot thoughts. I, I saw them recently perform this, uh, well, most of their hits, but a lot of songs off this album. And I was listening to it a lot getting ready for the concert this album grew on me throughout the year. I think I was, I liked it, but didn't love it when it came out. This is an album I really ride for now. And I think what I really like about it is just how they continue to grow as a band in spoon. I mean, this is probably their second or third strongest effort. Uh, they have a really long discography. So to say that is commendable, but the part that they really used this time was dance and an electronic sound to really give them some variety and move them in a new direction. And it pushed them and they definitely bring that out in their live shows. And this album in general just is good song one to song, what, 10 or 11. So definitely check Spoon out. Uh, give me your number seven and number six, Dave, and then we'll jump to the top, top fives. Sure. Uh, just one quick question. Do you think Hot Thoughts is the best or most interesting rock record of the year? um it's the well it depends on what you would count lcd sound system as but it'd be the highest one on my list if you don't count right. lcd sound system sure okay yeah that makes sense yeah lcd is definitely a little uh out there unique so yeah fair fair point uh you said seven uh, seven and six well yeah well uh six was uh vince staples and eight was flower boy and seven for me was all american badass by your man leon from mr robot joey badass yes KKK man, yeah, that's the guy. Uh, Joey came out with the first overtly political uh, record of 2017. I would say definitely the first of of raps kind. I mean, YG had fucked Donald Trump, but that was only a song last year. Right. Uh, All American badass. It's not. There's there's some anti-Trump sentiment throughout the songs, but uh, you know the overall sentiment's more about. Uh, the plight of the black man and, uh, you know, just racism and trying to be better. Uh, I think the song uh, Temptation has a video. That's a very lively song because it's about, uh, I think it's like about perseverance. And it's really, um, you know, it's not it's not all doom and gloom for Joy Badass. Right. But he does, you know, call it how it is. 
uh, and yeah, it's 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 a very criminally under listened uh, record. It did not do well in its first week, and I, I think that's because this is an album that's not going to garner new fans. You know, this is just playing doubling down on his bass because it's so hyper focused, such a concept album. Mm-hmm. But uh, you know, it definitely stands out in the rap landscape this year, and absolutely worth everyone's time. Yeah, this was a. Uh, I, I think this was an album that was forgotten and didn't necessarily get as much love as it needed yeah. to. Well, it, it came out the week before Kendrick, so that right. definitely didn't help. And that was, what, the same week as More Life, too? Uh, More Life was like a week before that, yeah. So, so yeah, it was it's a, a busy time. time to drop my, album. Um, my number six was Sampha, uh, Process. We talked about it at the beginning of the year. It's just a really beautiful album, an up-and-coming artist. I mean, he's worked with Kanye and Drake. Yep. Uh, he... His where, where he goes with these songs in this album, it's such a personal album about loss and grief and pain, and he delivers it so beautifully. Through and I mean, I think the songs that stick with me, the biggest song off the album was uh, "No uh, uh, Blood on Blood on Me," which is like he it's almost like exacerbated in the song. I, I I was reading up on the song just I was interested in how he got the sound, and he actually like went for a run before he would record the <laughs> the vocals because he wanted to sound like he was like running in, in this dreamlike song but the song that sticks with me most is not, no one knows me like the piano of my mother's home just very touching moving purely piano vocal sound and uh yeah uh, sampha is going to be huge i have no doubt about it this is a great first album so jumping into my top five i already talked about run the jewels i'm just gonna jump to my number four then LCD Sound System, American Dream. So I'm a huge LCD Sound System fan, Dave. I saw them again this past Friday, and I was interested because a lot of people knocked this album. A lot of big LCD fans were like not as high on American Dream. Mm -hmm. Did you check it out? No, I've been meaning to listen to them from the start, so I haven't started that yet. (laughs) That that was a smart move. Um, I think when I gave my review, I was high on it, but I said for an LCD effort, it's probably one of their worst. I judge LCD a lot, a lot of times by how they do live now, after seeing them three or four times. These songs fit into the live show very well. Um, I think the most interesting thing about this album and a reason why it's still an excellent album is James Murphy, the lead singer of LCD, uh, uses a lot more of personal experience. Wait one second. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he's a... Uh... He's an interesting figure, and I, I always like to dig on uh, LCD for their fake breakup. But uh, right, this this record ha- seems to have resonated. Yeah, he just used a lot more of of his own edginess. A lot, a lot of LCD before was focused on the softer side of, of pain, but he really brings a hard part to it, and he brings lcd sound from the first three albums into this one so it's a very eclectic album for them uh definitely worth listening and if you're gonna check out one song um other than the one that'll be on my top 10 list i would say tonight by them is the most lcd it's very cheeky but also brings in a dance sound with rock that fits so perfectly um i just fucking love lcd dude they're such a good band (laughs) uh what were your uh five and four songs so five was a Brockhampton record. Can you guess which one? Saturation 3. No, I decided to go with Saturation 1. I don't think I've sat with Saturation 3 enough to you know, make that call. So I'll uh, maybe I'll update that at some point. But right now it's Saturation 1. Uh, talked a lot about Brockhampton uh, last week before our Star Wars Last Jedi review. So check that out. It's about a slash nostalgia pod plus YouTube. But quick rehash. Brockhampton is a very eclectic, unique, uh, wide-ranging rap crew, self-styled boy band. Uh, they have a lot of good rappers in there, but they most importantly have bring a lot of unique ideas to song creation and uh, Sonics. And very Kanye West-inspired, very nerd-inspired. And they're only just beginning. They're going to be huge stars, so please get on board now while you can. I'm very excited to see them in concert this February. Um, so yeah, Saturation 1. Uh, probably their most famous song to date, uh, "Gold," is on that record, as well as a "Star," which has just amazing punchlines. So, uh, but overall, I mean, I think that album is probably eighty uh, percent like good to great. You know, it's it's it, I really enjoy it. I'm excited to get into them in the beginning of, of 
this coming year. Uh, you definitely turned me on to them. And uh, I listened to Boogie today just because I put it onto the Nostalgia Best Of list. And I was like <laughs> bobbing my head in my office. Like people were like looking in like, what the fuck am I listening to? It was it was great. It makes it's it not, more. Right? Yeah, it's fucking awesome, dude. Yeah. Uh, so number four is a record that came out very early in the year. But uh, I, it might it might be the first, you know, big record of 2017. I'm, I'm not sure if it came out before the XX or not. Uh, and this would be Culture by Migos. It definitely came out before. Well, I don't know. I think it did. But yeah, that I mean, Bad and Bougie was basically the, the song of the end of 2016, basically. It was right, yeah. Everywhere. Bad and Bougie came out in October and started bubbling, rising up. And then uh, Donald Glover put it over the top at the Golden Globes when he shouted them out. <laughs> yeah. Number one the next day. Uh, but yeah, I think Migos really came into their own this year. And of course, Offset and Quavo in particular had great years as solo artists as well. Um, yeah. And Culture as a record really showcases the triplets flow that they uh, made famous. And <laughs> the rap landscape has you know, used uh, in scores. Um, of course. <laughs> of course. Yeah. And of course, their chemistry as a trio, you know, they're all basically related. They've, they've known each other forever, but they'll finish each other's sentences. And obviously, the ad libs are uh, second to none. And on top of that, they just have a lot of fun records. And this album is full of them. I mean, you said Bad and Bougie. I mean, T shirt and Get Ready With You and Slippery yep. with an excellent Gucci main feature and mm -hmm. uh, Kelly Price with Travis Scott. You know, I mean, it's just, it, they're, uh, they're just such a fun group. That's and, what I was going to say. They're just so much fucking fun, dude. Yeah. <laughs> and I think culture, it's tough to really say anything bad about it because it's so good at what it's doing. Mm -hmm. Culture didn't make my list, but it was one of my honorable mentions. I didn't want to step on your, uh, your, your list, so I left it off, but definitely enjoyed that one. Uh, number three for you, Dave. Hova, 444. Throwing up the dynasty sign, bro. Yeah, dog. Jay Z. I saw. I saw him perform at the Meadows too, which was awesome. Uh, Jay Z. Did not know what to expect coming into this. You know, uh, his last two records, The Blueprint Three, and Nine of Carter, Holy Grail, were very corporate, very, uh, you know, uninspired. <laughs> I mean, Jay Z's only number one hit to date is Empire State of Mind, which, you know, is a fun song, but not the not the greatest song. Mm -hmm. uh, so he's kind of been up and down and the most exciting thing about his career the past you know six seven years actually even later because he, his records were <laughs> kingdom come in 06 was really bad too and american gangster was okay the most exciting thing he had done recently was watch the throne that was because kanye fucking uh produced the shit out of that you know mm -hmm. um so coming into this an old jay-z he just turned i believe 48 he was 47 when the record came out this summer uh you know we saw what happens when old rappers think they still got it with Eminem last week, you know? Uh, but Jay-Z did not do this. He came out with his most insightful, introspective, personal record to date. I mean, it, it was, I, I was, it's honestly, it's still kind of unbelievable that a rapper, <laughs> he's with the first rapper of his kind to make something so good at an old age. Cause rap is no doubt a young man's game. And, I mean, the story of OJ, that's a song that got a, what, saw a song of the year nomination from the mm -hmm. Grammys. Yep. And, um, I mean, OJ say, I'm not black, I'm OJ. Long pause. Okay. Like, that's more poignant, just okay, than scores of rappers this year, scores of anyone. Like, yep. And, I mean, you go through all the record, 444, the title track. It's like, oh, did Jay Z really cheat? It was just a stunt for Lemonade last year, right? And Jay Z's like, nah, bro, I cheated. Like, he just yeah. fucking spells it out. Um, and then even like his mom comes out as a lesbian on this. That would have been a huge deal if this was anyone else's record, you know, yeah. <laughs> if it was any other year. Uh, and then No ID's production is immaculate. Really, really uh, great attention to the album. Very cohesive. And the way it ends with Marcy Me is awesome. Uh, Great record that I think is actually a little underappreciated, under listened because it's stuck on title. Mm -hmm. um, but most of the songs actually have a, a YouTube video now, uh, like a music video, so you can listen to, I think, at least half the album that way. So I recommend that because yeah. uh, the highs are on this album are just so high. Um, I actually toyed with having this number one uh, wow. just because I think, as a record, it's incredibly cohesive, it, it's so focused and. Uh, you know, I really toy with it for number one. 
Yeah, I, I think I'll, we were talking about what to expect of Jay Z and uh, this album coming out. I think we were saying it was probably gonna be more like revival than what it turned out to be. Yeah. Um, so it's it's definitely exciting, uh, and it actually makes me feel optimistic for rappers as, as they get older. So I think up until this point, most people kind of say, well, well when you reach a certain age, you just don't have anything to say anymore. And your career basically fades away. But Jay-Z seems to be pa paving a different path, which uh, makes me exci excited because I don't want to see someone like Kanye West or Jay-Z fade off into the distance. I want to enjoy more of their songs. So hopefully they're yeah. able to do this successfully. Right. Uh, my number three was uh, Scissor, con uh, SZA, <laughs> SZA, Control. Jesus, it's been a long fucking day. Um, yeah, Control. I was I was playing this the other day just just to kind of uh, check out some of the songs I hadn't heard in a while, and I started off just from the beginning, and I just ended up listening to the first six songs without even noticing like I'd gotten through them, and they're all so fucking good. I think like one through six that might yeah. be the best beginning like strongest first six songs of an album this year in general um and this is her second effort as an artist and it's so personal and so well written a song like um you know doves in the wind that features kendrick or even like love galore which i've, I've seen a lot of people's like top 10 song lists didn't make my i, I picked actually a different one from this album which have been like sitting with for months now and just loving uh just so beautiful and SZA i think is going to be a fucking huge star and this is her coming out she said that she didn't even like music in <laughs> her last album which is yeah. kind of crazy That's, i mean like you said she's going to be a star best new artist nominated i think she's the yep. odds on favorite to win that uh, supermodel weekend like and the other song you're going to mention later is a lot of great songs Mm -hmm. And it, I'm I, as you know, as a rap fan, I've known of SZA for a long time because she signed the TDE, where Kendrick, Schoolboy, right. J. Rap, and Absol are signed. So, uh, you know, we we've known of her for a while, and we've also known of her issues, which is her output and just having trouble getting her music made. And I, I I've never expected SZA to release a critically acclaimed album like this. I mean, I, I you know, the, the, it was probably fifty fifty that she was going to fade away, you know, um, because mm -hmm. of her label issues and. I mean, what a, what a triumph, you know? I'm, I'm really happy, happy um, for her. So just to keep moving forward, Kendrick Lamar's Damn was my number two. There's not much else to other than, like, humble, loyalty, love, and DNA might be, like, four of the top songs on anyone's list if you did just didn't give a fuck about variety and just, like, I'm just going to pick right. the best songs. Those, I mean, the whole album is classic. Kendrick is, like, the stand, like, of rapping at this point and just uh, rap and R&B music making. Mm -hmm. I think what really made this album so wonderful to me was just where, like, the, the different places he went to on this album. Like, a song like Love, something we've never seen from Kendrick doing a love song. Right. He does it so perfectly, but not in a corny way, which, you know, you see someone like Drake, who is considered to be a peer of Kendrick and someone that's up on that level of, of stature in the rap game, he makes the corniest fucking songs ever. And people clown him for it. Kendrick makes a love song. People say that it's a beautifully written and, and poignant song. Um, yeah, damn. If you haven't listened to, it, I don't really know why you would listen to our podcast because it's pretty much the epitome of everything we like in music. So, <laughs> where, where's Dam on your list? Dam's number one for me. Um, yeah. The reason I toyed with Hove at number one is because I really think that Damn is Kendrick's least cohesive record. I think that's pretty unquestionable. Mm -hmm. um, this is his most radio-friendly record to date. Um, Poptimism? And it's, yeah, it's, kind, it's, it's honestly, it's just straight up not focused. Um, but because Kendrick is such a fucking stud, it also doesn't really matter. Yeah. To him, a butterfly was his touchdown. And Dam is just his victory celebration. Touchdown dance. Yeah. Lambo leap, um, if you will. An underappreciated song, the last song, Duckworth. Uh yeah. Lyrical as fuck. Uh, you, you mentioned corny songs, Drake getting clowned. I Kendrick should have been clowned more for uh, uh God. Yeah, probably. So God, like like that, <laughs> that song is Loki Whack. 
I'm not gonna lie. <laughs> Kendrick gets a pass for all the other quality he puts out, and you know it's it's actually interesting because as you're talking about his least cohesive album, I I mean I totally agree, but I think that just speaks to how cohesive his other albums are because not many people make albums as cohesive as Pimp a Butterfly, Good Kid, or even Good Kid, Mad City, you yeah. know. Um, so what was your number two then? If that was your number one, my number two is your number one. Oh, melodrama. This is. When we did yep. our, our mid-year, the, these were at, at the middle, and I was like, there's no way that we're going to get through the year with these two still being the top two. And we did, which I yeah. think just speaks to yeah, the quality. <laughs> so I, I wanna, I'll, I'll let you take the lead on talking about melodrama then. Uh, I mean, honestly, this is an interesting record because if you look at uh, all the outlets, some people have this song, this album top five on their list. Some people have this in the 40s. Everyone knows it's it's worth honoring, but the range is all over the place, and I think that really speaks to uh, just overall personal taste, honestly. Yeah. Um, but what you can't deny is uh, what Lord actually does on this album, and it's Lord is a pop star who became super famous at a very young age, of course, with uh, you know when Royals busted out when that was at 2013 so, or yeah. 2014 was a while ago, um, 2013, and she kind of went away since then. And she comes back a little older, a little more wizened, more experienced now, but she still kind of preserves her youth and tries to grapple with that on the record, despite now being really famous. And uh, it's really a shame that Greenlight and Supercut weren't bigger hits. Yeah. Uh, honestly, it's just kind of weird that it didn't happen. They just streaming. I just, you know, you just, you, you would have banked on that, but it didn't go really, really go that way. And then Liability is such a, Ballad. Um, the Louvre uh, has some great wordplay, and then uh, "Perfect Places" is poppy as hell. But I, oh. I, I, that's probably my favorite song on the record. Honestly, it's a little corny, but I, I really, really love it. Um, yeah, it's just it's probably the most. Uh, it's not even probably it's the most uh, important like pure pop music in the traditional sense. Record, yeah. no doubt. Um, yeah, I mean, Lord's still really young. She's about twenty one. 22 like really happy to see her career as it continues to grow you know especially for someone so young it's easy when you're writing an album that's mostly focused on um like the ending of a relationship the breakup and the post like the aftermath of it it's very easy to make these songs be grating and whiny and just very sad and lord takes such a different perspective on it i mean like green light is basically about the okay to move on and move forward and have a life like she delves in and out of the emotional highs of this record with such grace and you know a song like the Louvre, it, it's so different than any other song on the album and any pop song you'll ever hear because it basically takes a chorus out and replaces it with a, you know a sound a drum beat that, that, that was jack antonoff incarnate that yeah, song exactly and it, it's just I think it, it really pushes the boundaries of pop songs in 2017 and moving forward and just writing an album in general. There's, we talked about it a lot, so we don't need to belabor it, but definitely a, a fantastic album. I'm glad that we each uh, had it so high on our list. Um, let's jump to songs. I mean, we, we, we should probably just move through these pretty quickly because uh, I have so many honorable mentions I want to get to, but probably just going to pick out a couple of them. Uh, why don't you run through your honorable mentions real quick, then we'll, I'll do mine and we'll jump in. Sure. Uh, Hard Times by uh, Paramore. I think that's just uh, a lovely jam. Uh, Hills <laughs> by St. Vincent uh, really uh, struck me. I did not expect to like uh, any of her songs as much as I do that one. Mm -hmm. uh, Catch Out by Calvin Harris with Dram and uh, Schoolboy Q. That is a uh, excellent summer uh Summer flare, summer, uh, you know, little, yep. little, little song to play by the pool. Uh, Rick Flair drip, go woo on a bitch. Shout out Offset from Without Warning. Uh, that is just as peak Offset. <laughs> that is just that is just excellent, like triplet fellows. Like it, it, you just you can't touch it. Yep. Uh, so no uh, bank account by Twenty One Savage. Uh, fucking fucking banger. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, Transporting by Kodak Black. I did not expect to ever like a Kodak song as much as I do that song, but the, the production, his flow is awesome. Yep. And it's so lively. Really surprised uh, how much I love it. Um, 
Magnolia by my guy Cash Cardi. Uh, <laughs> Playboy Cardi. That, that might be the beat of the year, Magnolia. Um, I'll always make rock when I'm in New York, no question. Um, Plain Jane by ASAP Ferg. That's a, that's a great New York rap song, no doubt. Uh, and then lastly, Tell Me You Love Me by Demi Lovato. Uh, really speaks to me like, like it's a it's an awesome love ballad i don't know i, I love it uh and then uh i don't know i mentioned for me uh i don't have any hove songs on my list but my two favorite ones are 444 the title track and marcy me so awesome a lot of uh, good you know singles and one-offs and songs to, to pick i mean the single is more resonant in the album these days and you can definitely yeah. see that in people's uh top 10 song lists Oh, absolutely. Um, just to run through a couple, I think the two songs I just wanted to get out of the way that were just massive, but I didn't think deserved to make my list were uh, Feel It Still by Portugal the Man, Despacito, uh, Luis Fonzi, and Daddy Yankee featuring right. Bieber. Um, everybody's heard those. Charger by Gorillaz. Gorillaz we didn't really talk about uh, on this at all. Great Jones. Jones, dude, just fucking uh, haunting and, and awesome, and those, those guitars is yeah. fucking dope uh no known drink by the japan droids i mean that that song whenever i hear it, i just like automatically want to like run through a wall which is what i look for in a lot of these songs um new york by saint vincent and also happy birthday johnny are gorgeous songs yep that your mask you. off dude i fucking that that song i i wish i had seen that at the meadows i feel like i would have gone fucking nuts for that yeah um, uh it's fun being in a crowd of uh, of, of white kids yelling uh, Percocet, at <laughs> Molly Percocet when none of them fucking do Zans or anything. <laughs> um, just uh, two more I wanted to get to. Good Morning by Bleachers. We talked about uh, the Bleachers album when it came out. That was my favorite song off it. And also Queens of the Stone Age, like you used to do. Song really grew on me. And it really is just classic Queens of the Stone Age, but way more dancey than they ever were. It's just a really fun. Um, which brings me to my number 10 song of the year, Dave. Fior de Latte by Phoenix. Well, we talked about it. Yeah, I, I know you're not, you didn't really love the Phoenix album, but that that song just has stuck with me all year. I think it's the, the lightest on the album. It's basically the passion fruit of TMO, um, but <laughs> it's just light and it's fun and beautiful. And yeah, I, nothing more I can really say about it than that. What was your number 10? My number 10 was Crescendo by The Underachievers off their album Renaissance from April. Saw the song live in October. Uh, Underachievers, they're a rap duo from New York, from Flatbush, Brooklyn. And this is just them trading bars. And they have great chemistry. They always have. And uh, it's just, it's a great New York rap song. Uh, fantastic. And they're an uh, underappreciated uh, act because they're still kind of an underground internet uh, artist. But, um, crescendo might be their best song awesome what was your number nine my number nine so all right so i'm kind of cheating here <laughs> i picked blow your mind by dua lipa that's my favorite of her songs on the record i heard this song like in the summer or in the mm -hmm. spring at least when i was first finally googling her name and figuring out who she was right the song came out in fall 2016 i didn't know that because i didn't hear it then to my defense, I had Redbone and Bad and Bougie on my 2016 list. I was ahead of the curve with those songs. And you'll see those songs on lists this year, which is dumb. But I'll be a hypocrite because yeah. I'm going to pick a 2016 song right now. <laughs> I, I had a 2015 song on my 2016 list last year, so it's all good. I'll give you a pass on that one. Um, my number nine, a Spoon song. Do I have to talk you into it? Uh, it's like one of the few times on the record that Spoon kind of lets themselves go as a band, which is just really exciting. Um, they're very tight and very concise. Uh, and this song, at the end, they just start to let themselves go a little bit. And it's classic Spoon with a touch of wildness, which I just love that about them. Uh, my number eight, I, I shouted out earlier, Passion Fruit by Drake. Again, I know it's a corny ass song. I know Drake is corny as fuck sometimes. Super Mario Sunshine, dog. Yeah, th this song just makes me want to like sit outside in the sun and like get drunk and be light. It's, <laughs> it's awesome. So I think with the way things have gone this year, like politically, uh, sometimes you just need to be light, you know. And I'm gonna be talking about a song later on the list that is not so light, but I think I, especially for the songs I liked, I just wanted to not be thinking about problems sometimes. And 
Those right. were one of them. Uh, what was your number eight? My number eight was Say I Didn't by Vic Mensa. Um, this is the song that Vic and Chance played together um, at Lollapalooza this year. Uh, Chance isn't on the song, but he came out and uh, you know like ad libbed with uh, with Vic because uh, uh, they had kind of like a falling out behind the scenes. Obviously, they came up together in Chicago, but they they buried the hatchet publicly, and it, it really like you know like almost brought a tear to my eye seeing that because I've liked them for so long. <laughs> Uh, but even even taking that away, the song is uh, really personal, and uh, Vic, Vic really uh, has a lot to say about um, you know him himself as a person, and uh, you know his past uh, actions and his relationship with his parents and things like that. Um, and it's also qu- quite a lively song; and has a really good hook. Uh, so while the autobiography, uh, I think, is a up and down record overall, mm-hmm. I think that's clearly the strongest song on it. Yeah, that was an up and down record, but. Definitely, uh, definitely introspective and some some really high highs on it. So yeah, uh, what was your number seven? My number seven was "Big Fish" by Vince Staples, featuring Sir Jay of the Juice. Uh, mm. Man, I mean, "Back Back" is the most like interesting song he made, but "Big Fish" I think just is a slapper because yep. on one hand you have Juicy J, like I was up late night ball and just a great hook from Juicy J. And then you have Vince going into it with his verses and doing all the things he does on the record that we just talked about. And I, it's just a great union of, of, of Vince and how he can, uh, you know, wear two hats in the rap game. Yeah, that, that was one of, one of my honorable mentions. Uh, if you didn't uh, have it on your list, I would definitely want to shout that one out. My number seven was How Do You Sleep by LCD Sound System. It's a nine minute song, but. Uh, you know, James Murphy basically steals the concept from John Lennon's How Do You Sleep? He, you know, or Lennon attacks McCartney. Uh, Murphy's going after Tim Goldstein, his old producing partner. And it's like a cutting song. It's very, it's very personal. It really attacks this guy. Um, but it switches up about halfway through and there's like this classic LCD uh, drop almost it's not really even a drop but it's just like this change up and the synths start to like just come like poking through and it's fucking brilliant and it's like everything i love about the new lcd sound system record in one song so nice. had to put it on there number six a song i was uh mentioning before praying by kesha you're gonna hear this song a lot of places i think with the political climate especially the uh, sexual misconduct that's been coming out with all the Harvey Weinstein allegations. And this was really one of like the first major stories about like a, a man in power using that power against a, a female star. Um, Kesha's, this is like her triumphant return. Um, right. It's good to have Kesha back. I, you know, her album was up and down. Uh, this song jumps out and her vocals on it are just so like screeching and personal and emotion filled. It's uh just really powerful and really resonated, I think, for the year, um, and probably moving forward as well. So definitely worth worthy of the list, in my opinion. What was your number six and your number five, Dave? My number six was "Crew" by Goldlink, with Brent Fiaz in the hook and Shag Lizzie the feature. Verse um, Goldlink and Shag Lizzie were both 2015 Double XL freshmen, and they hadn't done a whole lot since then. And then Goldlink came out. At what cost? A pretty solid record, but Crew is just a total smash. I think as a rap song, it's just it's really tough to top. Um, great verse, soulful ass hook, and then Shaq Lizzie just fucking burns it down when he comes in at the end. And I mean, I, I've watched videos of this being performed live, and I really wish I had uh, not missed Gold Link when he was in Boston. Um, yeah, I think this is just a fucking banger. Simple as that. Yeah, Gold Link, I feel like I, I listen to like one of his songs like every month somehow and I'm always like find myself like into it. So I definitely should check him out more. What was your number five song? My number five was Perfect Places by Lord. Um I just think it's the it's the Lord song I always go back to off melodrama the most, funny enough. I know it's some people actually dislike the song. I know it's pretty uh pretty cheesy. Pretty you know, it's like all oh, millennial pride, but mm-hmm. I don't know. I I I think it's it's uh Pretty powerful. It's a great, it's a great song. My uh, my number five was "On Hold" by the XX. 
pretty much just because Jamie XX got to do his thing on this and putting in the hollow notes. I can't go for that sample. So catchy and so much fun. And uh, it, it really just uh, delivered uh, on the, an XX return. So, uh, I mean, it was dropped, I think, like New Year's Day or like a day or two after. Yeah, so it was the really, lead like, single. Of the year. Um, number four for me, the, the SZA song I was talking about before, Drew Barrymore. Man, I fucking love this song. It's so, so personal. She talks, but like she's funny and like sarcastic on on the chorus, um, and then it has like the drums doom, and then it goes into this beautiful SZA vocal. Um, yeah, just a really awesome song. I think uh, Chris Ryan was the one that originally like shouted that song out off the record, so I really wanted to like keep my ear out for it. Mm-hmm. And Chris Ryan. Hardly ever steers me wrong, and this what he definitely uh, uh, one of the goats, definitely. Um, so, what, what was your what did you just do? Number five, so four and three for you. Yeah, number four, uh, let's get right with you by Amigos. Um, Hold up, get right. I'm gonna get, get right with you. <laughs> uh, so, Bad and Bougie, obviously last year's list lead single, but T-shirt, Slippery, they're bigger songs than Get yeah. Right With You, but Get Right With You is the song they've been coming out to start their sets with throughout the year. And I just cannot stop coming back to this because this is just their chemistry uh, at an all-time high. Uh, they, they, they take turns all spitting a awesome verse. It's just pure Migos. Um, and it's just a really fun, really excellent song. Yeah, Migos. That, those, those four songs you mentioned when you were discussing culture right. are the songs that I think I keep coming back to and are just phenomenal. Uh, what was your number three? My number three. So I, I wanted to pick a Brockhampton song. I had to think about which one I wanted to pick. I picked Saturation 1 for my record, but I'm actually going to pick a Saturation 2 song for my song list. Uh, Star and Gold from Saturation 1 and then Boogie from Saturation 3 were in the running. But I actually ended up picking Gummy from uh, Saturation 2. And Kevin Abstract, he's the front man. He's the, star, the biggest star of Brockhampton. And the way he switches his flow uh, at the beginning of this song I never stops uh, getting me. Like I, I've talked a lot about Brock Hand in the past few weeks, but uh, this is one of their best songs, and I uh, it's probably my favorite song they've made to date. Yeah, I, I don't I, I don't think there's many times where I feel like surprised by vocal performances anymore. But like when a rapper can really switch up their flow well, like sometimes the way Kendrick is able to like use his voice as a, an instrument. Um, right or switch his flow up. It really, it really can elevate a song to the next level. Um, my my number three song of the year, "Green Light" by Lord. Um, I, I mean, it's just an amazing song. That that piano, like, should have been bigger. Yeah, it should have been bigger. And just the, the way that that piano comes in, it's so like triumphant and it like crescendos into this like larger ending. It's just really, really. Uh, m- exciting and like it right. really gets you going it makes you want to dance number two was humble by kendrick um i mean everybody's heard this song by now you, i think the thing that for the the top two songs that i'll just i'll just jump into my number one as well here in a second um it was just the songs that everybody liked but that were also good songs right um humble there's that that video i think it was like in arizona at a concert when he literally stops singing and the whole crowd just does yeah, this whole verse awesome. <laughs> and no one misses a beat. And I was like, that's the power of Kendrick. And this song especially just resonated. It was just right. the beats catchy. The, the lyrics are amazing. My number one, Bodak Yellow by Cardi B. I, I had to give her the number one spot. Being the first female artist to top the uh, charts F, since Lauren Hill was the top of the Billboard 100 yep. chart. After yep, since 99 with Doop. Yep, Almost 20 years. Um, in this song, it's like the most braggadocious like song ever, and she just fucking kills it. And I always think about that video we talked about in the pod of those people in that like train Sub- station, subway station. It was old people, it was young people, it was black, white, every every race, uh, age. Just love this song, and it's it's fantastic, and it epitomizes twenty seventeen to me. Yeah, no. So I don't have Bodak Yellow on my list because it's you know it's my personal enjoyment, but in terms of impact. Uh, you mentioned Despacito. Mm-hmm. That song is the most streamed song of all time. 4.6 billion streams. Crazy. So you have to have that up there. And I think the other song has to be Bodak Yellow because 
so it's inspiring to so many women yep. uh just as you know a female empowerment it's awesome but also cardi b is such a success i mean yep she's such an endearing personality she's just very herself she's anything but fake and I, you we've known that since she was just an instagram star off love and hip-hop and yeah the fact that bodak yellow became so big but top of that she just set a new record she's the first female rapper ever to have her first three chart entries all reach the top 10 because her feature with g easy no limit you know fuck with me and get some money that is uh in the 10 10 right now and then motorsport her song with uh migos from culture 2 uh, the, the lead single that's number six right now. So she has, and then Bodak Yellow I think is like seven or eight. So she has like six, seven, and eleven right now. Uh, sorry, Bodak Yellow is eleven. So she has three top eleven songs as we speak. She's unstoppable. Uh, Cardi right B is unstoppable, and she doesn't even have a debut album yet. You know, and she <laughs> doesn't even need insane. because she's making all the fucking bread, just killing it. Um. So yeah, shout out Cardi B, Bodak Yellow, uh, without a doubt, one of the most impactful and important releases of the year. Definitely. So give me your, your top songs. Right. So two, uh, I picked Element by Kendrick Lamar. Yeah, that's uh, a great one. That's a video, but it's not DNA. It's not Humble. It's not Loyalty. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not the most famous song. Um, but Element has a great beat switch up. Mm -hmm. Element has a great flow switch up. And Element uh, also has probably my favorite quotable of the year. I don't do it for the gram. I do it for Compton. Uh, <laughs> You know, we don't have to talk about Kendrick again, but uh, Element's my favorite song off off a amazing album full of bangers. Yep, absolutely. And what's your number one? Number one, I've spoiled this for a while now. It's EXO Tour Life by Little Uzi Vert. Um, I think it's the millennial opus uh, thus far. Uh, it's so interesting because this song was put out by uzi in a hotel room on soundcloud because he didn't want to save it for his album he just put it out and so much he didn't even bother fixing the file it was exo tour life with two l's and the e was a three he didn't even bother to fix it um but the song was such an unlikely hit but then you listen to the song i mean he got all my friends are dead push me to the edge he got a little kid singing that like it's a fucking nursery rhyme. <laughs> but even more importantly, the reason I like it so much, I think it's such an important song. And I thought it was going to be the most influential song of the year until Bodak came around. Um, and I, it, it, I still believe it'll be very resonant and uh, yeah. important for a long time. But it openly talks about uh, his, he openly talks about his uh, addiction and uh, substance uh, dependence. Uh, I'm committed, not addicted, but it keep controlling me. You know, I mean, it's 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 basically a cry for help, and you know, we look at little peep overdose this year, and uh, ASAP Ems wasn't that long ago, and mm -hmm. you know, he's talking about his issues, and it happens to be on a hit song that's really important, but also, um, you know, Uzi as an artist is very uh, he kind of mixes genres because he he wear a Marilyn Manson sh shirt on his Fader cover, you know, um, he's he's very very unique, but he also represents. Uh, both the age of SoundCloud and also yeah. the, uh, you know, the rock star persona that artists like to give themselves and not call himself a rapper. So I think because of everything it represents, but also the uh, people take the song, uh, it's my number one record. Yeah, Uzi, I mean, I think this is a very surprising song to me. I never really saw him as an artist that... Um would have something to say that that resonates this much with people and especially i think like younger generations um you know this song is like like you said it's the opus for millennials it's just <laughs> it's like so dramatic but in the same way like what he's talking about in there is so serious and, and meaningful like you said it's uh, it's a song that i think deservedly is, is number one for you and i think also a song that will live on and have a long life because it, not only is it so catchy but like you said it it touches something for people that goes deeper than just an enjoyable banger right you know, and to top it all off for exactly and to top it all off i'm seeing uzi uh perform tomorrow at the time recording, ah, so. there you Very go excited. full circle um and just uh just if you guys want to listen to these songs we have all of them on our nostalgia best of 2017 list um, spotify playlist um, so check those out. You can go to our uh, Nostalgia Pod Twitter page, and we have it pinned right at the top. 
So definitely check that out. Um, any last thoughts on the year music days? Yep. No, I mean, I thought I think this is a really strong year overall. Um, I agree. Not a strong year for rock as a genre, not a strong year for traditional pop as a genre, but overall, I think it's a really strong year. We saw a lot of cool things and we talked about the trends. Um, music's in a good place. And we'll talk more about our most anticipated records for 2018. I was just going to say, I, I have a lot. It. But um, I have a lot, yeah. So we'll talk about that soon. So please, uh, you know, subscribe on YouTube and follow us at soundcloud.com slash nostalgia pod and make sure you don't miss it. Uh, and check out our episodes of, of best TV shows of 2017 from a few weeks ago, our Last Jedi spoiler cast, and as well as our best movies of 2017 later this week. Absolutely. We will be bringing you best movies next week, as Dave said. Uh, until then, enjoy our end of year. Uh, we love you. Peace out.